Harold Clayton Lloyd was born in Burchard, Nebraska on April 20th, 1893 to James Darcy Lloyd, known as Foxy, and Elizabeth Fraser Lloyd. Harold will later describe his early life as being as picturesque as Tom Sawyer's, but in reality, it's more difficult. His father is a ne'er-do-well, a man of big ideas, but few accomplishments. Throughout Harold's early years, the family moves frequently from one town to another in Nebraska and Colorado, as Foxy tries to make a success of himself. On February 22, 1901, Harold's future wife, Mildred Hillary Davis, is born in Philadelphia, though she spends most of her childhood and adolescence in Tacoma, Washington. Before he is 10 years old, Harold has his first experience on stage when he wins a bit part in a local production of Macbeth. He's immediately hooked. Fortunately, both of his parents are supportive of Harold's theatrical ambitions, especially his mother, who once had aspirations of becoming a concert singer. In 1910, Elizabeth can no longer stand the family's rootless existence and divorces Foxy. Harold remains with his mother after his parents separate. One year later, Foxy is struck by a beer truck operated by a drunken driver and is awarded $3,000, a considerable sum in those days. He and Harold decide to use the money to start a new life. They flip a coin to decide their destination, New York or California. The coin toss sends them west and they settle in San Diego, California. In San Diego, Harold pursues a stage career full time, joining an acting school run by his friend John Lane Connor, the Connor School of Expression. In 1913, Harold appears in his first film, securing a small part as a servant in the old monk's tale for the Edison Company. At this point, he has no real interest in appearing on screen, still dreaming of becoming a great stage actor but like so many others, taking the job to earn some extra money. Little does he dream where this will lead. When his father's latest business venture fails, he and Harold move to Los Angeles. Adept at applying his own makeup by now, he puts on a character face and sneaks onto the Universal Studio lot with the actors after lunch. He makes friends with the guard, and before long is able to walk onto the lot without a disguise. Extras are hired on a daily basis, depending on the needs of various films in production. Only those with ambition and determination make the cut. Harold becomes friendly with another young man seeking employment every morning. His name is Hal Roach, and they appear in several films together, usually as incidental characters in the background. They talk and share their dreams of achieving real success in the movie business. When Roach comes into some money, he starts his own company called Roland Films and hires Harold to be his star in a series of comedy shorts. In those days, it doesn't take much to create a 10-minute comedy. Just a few ideas, a camera, a setting, a leading lady, a villain, and a comic. Roach directs the films and Harold creates his first screen character, a rather forgettable fellow named Willie Work. In 1917, Harold devises another character named Lonesome Luke, Clearly inspired by the enormous success of Charlie Chaplin, Luke has tight-fitting clothes instead of baggy pants. But he's still a tramp, one of many such figures in silent comedy who are pale shadows of the great Chaplin. In 1917, Harold attends a play and gets an idea from watching a meek preacher on stage wearing horn-rimmed glasses. This will be his new persona, no more clownish get-ups like so many other movie comics. Instead of a grotesque, he will be a regular fellow, the boy next door. Hal Roach isn't convinced and urges him to alternate these new experimental comedies with the tried and true Lonesome Luke shorts until the new character proves to be a success. Then there's no turning back. The first film to present the so-called glass character is Over the Fence, released in 1917. His leading lady is an adorable teenage girl named B.B. Daniels, who will go on to become a major star in her own right. His little stock company includes Australian-born Harry Snub Pollard, who will also star in his own Hal Roach comedies in the 1920s, and burly Bud Jameson, who plays a Chaplin-esque heavy. In 1919, he loses B.B. Daniels to producer and director Cecil B. DeMille, who offers her a featured role in one of his prestige pictures, Male and Female. Harold chooses a pretty, all-American blonde actress named Mildred Davis as her replacement. Harold's life takes a dramatic turn on August 24, 1919. 
While posing for publicity photos, he fools around with a smoking bomb, thinking it's only a prop. Instead, the bomb actually explodes. Fortunately, Harold has just used it to light a cigarette and lowered the bomb away from his face. Even so, he is bloodied and temporarily blinded, and part of his right hand is blown away. Hollywood is a small community in those days, and during Harold's long recovery, he's cheered on by the good wishes of innumerable colleagues. At first, he has no idea if he'll ever be able to work again. In time, he regains his sight, and eventually, showing the same can-do spirit as the character he plays on screen, he decides that he cannot abandon the thing he loves most and returns to performing. He commissions a prosthetic glove to wear on his right hand to hide the loss of several fingers. No one who sees his later thrill comedies will have any idea that he is performing those hair-raising stunts with only partial use of that hand. Harold Lloyd returns to the screen in 1920, and his popularity grows as his two real comedies become slicker and funnier than ever. His glass character is now a fixture on movie screens. He also expands on an idea he first tried in a 1919 short called Look Out Below, thrill comedies. High and Dizzy, made in 1920, and Never Weaken in 1921, cement a pattern that he will expand on and improve just a few years later. In 1922, he makes a bold step, following in the footsteps of Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, Buster Keaton, and Charlie Chaplin, and leaves short subjects behind to make his first feature-length film. And like Chaplin, he realizes that in order to sustain an audience's interest, his character has to have more depth than the breezy, straw-hatted go-getter he's been playing. Grandma's Boy has heart and sentiment as well as laughs, and it's a winning combination that launches his feature film career in fine fashion. After filming Safety Last, Mildred Davis's contract is up, and she announces her intention to leave. Harold counters by asking her to marry him, and they wed on February 10, 1923. But he still has to find another leading lady on screen. On April 1st of 1923, Safety Last is released, and it is a triumph, carving Harold a unique niche in the annals of silent film comedy and popular culture as the man who dangles from a clock high on a building. Like all his subsequent films, this one is the result of trial and error, refining the setup and timing of each sequence until it is absolutely perfect. The audience response is amazing and vocal. Some theaters have ambulances standing by, a good publicity stunt, but apparently a wise precaution, as some moviegoers swoon at Harold's near misses with calamity. Safety Last makes a fortune and sets Harold on track for the rest of his career. Harold makes a major career move by deciding to leave his longtime producer and partner, Hal Roach, to set up his own studio. He takes along many of his closest colleagues. Now, like Charlie Chaplin, he will have complete control over his schedule, his staff, and most importantly, his films, which he will own in perpetuity. Later, he will negotiate to buy out Hal Roach's interest in the earlier films as well. His first feature as an independent producer is Girl Shot a wonderfully funny comedy that's built on the foundation of a character people can recognize, but winding up with the sensational chase scene. Its success enables Harold to continue at a comfortable pace, releasing one new feature film a year. With the departure of Mildred Davis, Harold's leading lady for the balance of his silent film career is winsome Jobina Ralston. Rounding out the important and successful year of 1924, Mildred gives birth to their first child, Gloria, who was born on May 21st. In 1925, Harold turns out his most popular movie to date, The Freshman. It is a quintessential Harold Lloyd movie about a shy, well-meaning fellow who has to overcome tremendous odds to make good, for the sake of his own self-esteem and to win over the girl he loves. By the time he makes the climactic run to score the decisive point in a crucial football game, audiences are cheering out loud. Harold is now enjoying a winning streak, often surpassing his comedic colleagues at the box office. For Heaven's Sake follows in 1926, and The Kid Brother comes to theaters in 1927. In 1927, Harold Lloyd is among the first wave of stars to leave his handprints in cement at Sid Grauman's world-famous Chinese theater on Hollywood Boulevard. This is one more indication of his status as one of the top stars in all of filmdom. 
Harold sets up camp in New York City to film key scenes for his next feature, Speedy. This gives him a unique urban backdrop for yet another hair-raising chase scene, and also allows him to invite one of the city's favorite celebrities, George Herman Babe Ruth, to make a cameo appearance. During production in New York, Harold also completes his autobiography, An American Comedy, which offers fans an honest, behind-the-scenes look at how much work and thought goes into each of his movies. It also leaves no question as to who is the chief architect behind these enormously successful comedies. In 1928, Variety, the show business bible, names Harold as the richest actor in the movie world. Equally as important, bounties of fan popularity polls declare Harold the world's most popular comedy star. That same year, Harold is ready to start previewing his latest feature, Welcome Danger, when he sees a sound newsreel and decides that it is imperative that his newest film be a talkie. Some footage can be salvaged, but Welcome Danger will have to go back into production as Harold and his team face the formidable challenge of working with sound for the first time. In 1929, Harold realizes a dream and moves his family into a custom-built mansion named Greenacres in Beverly Hills. The house has 44 rooms and sits on 16 acres of land. A housewarming party goes on for days. The house is spectacular even by Hollywood standards. There is a huge formal garden and a series of 12 decorative fountains, including an Italian-style waterfall with 21 basins. A special feature on the property is a miniature house in the children's play yard that features a thatched roof right out of a storybook. Inside, there is child-sized furniture and all the amenities of a real house, including electricity and hot and cold running water. When Christmas rolls around, Harold installs a magnificent tree and begins collecting elaborate ornaments from around the world. The tree seems to get bigger and more spectacular with each passing year, and he's reluctant to take it down at the end of the holiday season. Harold is justly proud of his home and knows that it is a direct reflection of his status as a self-made man. A boy from humble beginnings was now a part of Hollywood royalty. In 1930, Mildred and Harold decide to adopt a little girl so Gloria will have a playmate. Peggy joins the family, and as these things will happen a year later, Mildred gives birth to another child, Harold Jr. But unlike some families, the Lloyds don't have to worry about adding on an extra room to accommodate the growing brood. When it comes to home movies, Harold goes first class all the way, having staff members from his studio drop by the house and shoot them in 35 millimeter sound. Ladies and gentlemen, to whom it may concern, this is the whole damn family. And what a happy damn family we are. <laughs> damn, damn, damn. Now wait, Gord, what are you going to say, sweetie? I'm glad that Daddy isn't going to China. Okay, what are you going to say? Hey! hey. What are you where going to say, Where are you going, going Big Boat Tira. Oh, really? goodness <laughs> sake. This gives us, in the 21st century, a unique look at Harold and his family, including Harold's father, Foxy, mother, Elizabeth, and brother, Gaylord. In 1930, Harold releases Feet First, his first attempt to replicate one of his silent thrill comedies in the talkie era. Moviegoers are still eager to see their longtime favorite, and the film is a hit. But as the 1930s go on, his youthful go-getter somehow seems out of step, for an audience battered by the Depression. People seem to crave something new, and many stars who are holdovers from the silent era find themselves in the same boat as Harold, seen overnight as being old-fashioned. It isn't Harold who's changed so much as the audience. In 1932, he releases what many consider to be his best talkie feature, Movie Crazy. Following its premiere, Harold takes his family to Europe. It's now two years between films for the star, the Cat's Paw I'm comes out in 1934, and The Milky Way, his collaboration with top comedy director Leo McCary, follows in 1936. Harold Lloyd is still a name to reckon with, but he's not the box office king he was just a few years earlier. In 1937, Mildred adds a special attraction to one of the hallways at Greenacres, a rogues gallery of personally autographed photos, gifts to Harold from celebrated people, ranging from movie stars to heads of state. 
In the years to come, guests will often stop to admire this unique collection of pictures inscribed to one of the world's most famous men. In 1938, Harold returns to the screen in his final film of the decade, Professor Beware. He has a fresh young leading lady in Phyllis Welch and a bevy of experienced character actors surrounding him. But the film is not one of the comedian's best. And after its completion, he announces his retirement. Of course, someone as highly motivated as Harold Lloyd doesn't stay idle for long. In the early 1940s, he produces a pair of comedy features for the RKO studio. And in 1944, he agrees to host a half-hour network radio anthology called the Old Gold Comedy Theater. Then, in 1947, he agrees to collaborate with the brightest new talent on the comedy horizon, writer and director Preston Sturges, on a film to be called The Sin of Harold Diddlebach. Sturges' idea is to open the movie with the climax of Harold's silent classic, The Freshman, and then show what happens to that character after 20 years' time. He even incorporates a sequence on a building ledge. Howard Hughes bankrolls the film, but isn't satisfied with the finished product and keeps it on the shelf for three years before giving it a half-hearted release in an edited version called Mad Wednesday. This turns out to be Harold Lloyd's screen farewell. In the late 1940s, Harold discovers 3D photography. And while it becomes a popular hobby throughout Hollywood, he takes it much further than most other amateurs, shooting almost 300,000 stereo slides over the next 20 years. He photographs a number of popular movie stars, including one of Tinseltown's newest, Marilyn Monroe, and a model who will become renowned in years to come, Betty Page. In 1949, Harold Lloyd is elected imperial potentate of the famous fraternal and benevolent association known as the Shriners. In 1952, his daughter Gloria gives birth to Suzanne, who spends all of her youth at Greenacres with her grandparents. Suzanne will later assume control of her grandfather's film library and even compile popular books of his 3D photos. In 1953, Harold is accorded a singular honor, a special Academy Award for his work as a master comedian and good citizen. This occurs on the first night the Oscar show is televised from coast to coast to an audience of millions. Later that same year, Harold decides to re-release The Freshman, and while in New York to promote its opening, appears as a mystery guest on the popular panel show, What's My Line? In 1955, Harold is surprised by producer and host Ralph Edwards on his enormously popular television show, this is your life. For a half hour, Harold is surrounded by friends, colleagues, and family members who recount his amazing life story. The tribute comes as a complete surprise to Harold, who one year earlier appeared on shows paying tribute to silent comedy producer Max Sennett and former leading lady B.B. Daniels. After years of tinkering, Harold finalizes a feature-length compilation called Harold Lloyd's World of Comedy which debuts at the Cannes Film Festival in 1962. It goes on to appear on theater screens around the world. Since he controls the rights to his library and has never sold his films to television, this is the first opportunity for an entire generation to see the comedian in action. The feature earns rave reviews and creates many new fans. One year later, Harold follows this with another compilation called Harold Lloyd's Funny Side of Life. To help promote these films, Harold Lloyd appears on a variety of television programs, including The Steve Allen Show and The Tonight Show. His film clips are greeted with tremendous laughter and approval. During the 1960s, Harold decides that his famous Christmas tree has grown too big to dismantle after the holiday season, so it remains a permanent fixture at Green Acres. In 1969, Harold Lloyd meets the first group of fellows at the newly formed American Film Institute and answers their questions following a screening of his work. His foundation later makes a generous gift to the AFI, and they name the Harold Lloyd Master Seminars in his honor. His foundation also funds the Harold Lloyd Soundstage at USC and scholarships and grants at that film school, as well as UCLA and Loyola Marymount University. In 1971, Harold Lloyd dies at the age of 77. In the 1970s, Green Acres is open to the public for the first time, enabling them to see this historic Hollywood home. But the project is not self-sustaining. 
Green Acres is later sold at auction in 1975 and subdivided, although in 1984 it is named to the National Register of Historic Places. In 1993, another landmark is given that same status, Harold's Birthplace at 24 Pawnee Street in Bertrand, Nebraska. In 1994, Harold is one of 10 silent screen stars selected to grace a set of 29 cent United States postage stamps with caricatures by the legendary Al Hirschfeld. Finally, in 2005, Harold Lloyd's films joined the other landmarks of movie history on DVD in the United States.